Part one. You will hear a conversation between a student and an accommodation officer. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Well, you have left things a bit late. Have you tried looking for somewhere in Newbridge? Newbridge? No, I haven't. I've never heard of Newbridge. Well, let me show you. I've got a map here. Here's where everything is. You come into Newbridge over the bridge, and the main road in front of you is surprisingly enough the High Street. This is one of the main streets. Hmm. And branching off to the left, you can see there is West Street. That is another busy part of town. I see. Now, as I was saying, here is the High Street, and here is West Street going left. Now, if you go along West Street, the first place you come to on your right is the supermarket. It's not a very big one, but it's got most things you're likely to need. Next to it. There's the old town hall. I say the old town hall because it is about a hundred years old, but it will soon make way for a car park. I'm afraid. I suppose the car is king. Now, opposite the supermarket is the railway station. You can get very frequent buses and trains from here into the university. And next to that is the sports centre. It's a brand new one and was built on the site of some tennis courts. So that's progress. <laughs> It's got everything the keen sportsman like yourself might require. Now that's the centre of town, and I want to point out to you the buildings opposite the supermarket, but on the other side of London Road. There are two buildings there. The one further away from the High Street is called the Heights, and the one nearer the High Street is called the Towers. What are they? They are where you could find a flat. One of them, the Heights, has a number of flats for rent at the moment. Oh, good. Now look at questions. Now the first one is flat four. That's a nice flat with a balcony, and you need to apply to the Newbridge Accommodation Agency to ask about that one. You'll find their number in the phone book. Number six is another nice one which has been empty for a while, and you can ring the owner directly. I think. Yes, I've got her number written here. There it is. Right. Thank you. Good. Now, number eight is a re-advertisement. Ah,、uh, what do you mean? Well, it did have a tenant, but now it is for rent again. So I'd like to ask about that one. Leave it with me, and I'll look into it for you. Then we can talk about it when I've got more information. Okay. Are there others in this block? Yes, there's number ten. Now this one's a bit strange. It's advertised with an agency as well as privately in the local paper. Normally, if it's advertised through an agency, you shouldn't really go behind the agency and go directly to the owner. But on this occasion, I suggest you just answer the advert here in the newspaper, which the owner has obviously put in. Okay. Finally, there is number fourteen. This is with the New Start Agency. This is an agency started by the girl who was my assistant here, and she left to make money for herself. So she's not my favourite person. But I'm afraid I would have to advise you to go through the agency anyway. Again, their number is in the phone book. All right, is that something for you to be starting with? That's great.、Uh, but、uh, what kind of place is Newbridge? It's a nice place. 
It was developed about a hundred years ago, really for people who worked in the factories around there. They were clothing factories and everyone worked in them, men, women, boys and girls. Then, when the factories closed down, things got very difficult for the town. There was a huge amount of unemployment, until a few years ago when, in the telecoms boom, a company making mobile phones started up. I think your phone was made in Newbridge. And now this company employs most of the people in the town. There are new housing estates on the edge of the town, but they're mostly occupied by young families, and there isn't much student accommodation there. Most flats and so on are in the centre. That sounds good. Well, let me know how you get on. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear an introduction to the facilities and regulations of the main university library. You will hear three different speakers describe different aspects of the library. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Hello, my name's John Giles. It's good to see you all here for this part of your orientation to the university. Libraries can be complicated and frightening places for new students, and my job's to make you feel welcome, show you how you can find your way around, and introduce you to people who can give you further information and advice about using the library. I'll give you a general introduction to the printed materials, then Susie, who you will meet in a few minutes, will talk about our multimedia services. And finally, Jonathan Freeland, our head librarian, will outline the rules and regulations you must observe as library users. First, though, on behalf of my colleagues and myself, I want you to know that we are all at your service. Unlike many libraries, we insist that all our librarians have an additional qualification in at least one of the subjects taught in the university. You will find librarians who are specialists in science, social sciences and humanities. Most of our staff are also currently doing research and thus up to date with the periodical and internet literature as well as the books. The second advantage we enjoy here is that all our books and periodicals are available from this building. Some of them have to be ordered from our underground stores known as the stacks but you don't have to visit more than one building to find the materials you need. This is because we are purpose-built. Now, how do you find your way around? As you no doubt saw in the entrance hall, there is a plan of the library showing you where the books and periodicals can be found for any particular subject. We keep the books and periodicals for each subject on the same floor. So, for instance, environmental sciences are colour-coded green and are housed on the ground floor towards the front. Geography is colour-coded brown and can be found on the ground floor towards the back of the building. Each room is organised on the same plan. Reference books, which cannot be taken out of the library, are found at the far end of each room, near the librarian's desk, or station as we call it. Next to them, on the right, are periodicals for the last two years. The rest of the shelves contain general books on the subject. These can be borrowed. Lastly, the domestic arrangements. Seating in the library is of two kinds, rectangular tables for up to six people and individual study booths known as carols. No, not Christmas carols. At every seat there is a PowerPoint for a laptop computer 
There is also a panel which lights up to tell you when a book you have ordered is ready for collection from the librarian's desk. After all that hard work, you'll be ready for something to eat. And there are slot machines on every floor where you can buy food and drink. In the basement is a cafeteria where you can order fast food such as pizza, hamburgers, and also fish and chips, salad and fruit. You mustn't bring food and drink into the reading rooms though. Ah, here's Susie Wallace to tell you about the high-tech facilities of the library. Thanks, John. Don't worry, this isn't going to require a degree in systems engineering to get the hang of. Anyway, with computers and audio systems, the best way to learn is by doing. But here's a few tips to get you started. If there's anything else you want to know... Now look at questions... Each piece of equipment has a manual explaining how to use it and either I or Elaine, my very capable assistant, will be on hand to get you sorted out. First off, I'd like you all to follow me over to the Multimedia Centre. You have to come through this room to get to it in any case. Then gather round and I'll talk about each piece of equipment as we get to it. Right, here we are. Now, the Multimedia Centre, or MMC for short, houses all the computer facilities you'll need for your degree studies and your language learning. Many of you are studying electronics or similar subjects. We have terrific facilities for learning CAD, Computer Aided Design, for you non technies Some leading companies have donated equipment and state-of-the-art software packages. That's a spin-off from our thriving Industry Links programme. Many of you will be going on for your job experience. But to get back to the point, we have 44 PC terminals and 6 Macs. The Macs are loaded with fantastic software for you, art and design and textile design students. Over here, you can see our two widescreen TV monitors. They can receive broadcasts in most Asian and European languages, as well as English. For English language news, we encourage you to use the Student Union TV room so that those who are learning other languages can use these. Some useful broadcasts come at awkward times, so if you get a note from your academic advisor on a form we'll give you, we can tape up to two hours a week for you. In a moment, I leave you to explore on your own. But here's our head librarian to say a brief word about library regulations. Good morning. I'm sorry to sound like a police officer, but there are a few rules we all need to observe for the benefit of everybody. Courtesy to staff and other library users comes high up the list. Second, the security and safekeeping of materials is essential. All library items are electronically tagged. If the beeper goes off as you leave, you must return to the checkout desk. You are not allowed to bring any bags, packages or outdoor clothing into the reading rooms. You must leave them in the lockers outside in the corridor. You must take reasonable care of library materials while they are in your possession and return them within two weeks of borrowing them. Failure to return them on time without a good reason will result in a fine. When you register to join the library, you will get a copy of the full rules and you must sign this to say that you obey them. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation on animal protection. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Thanks for joining us today, Mike. How did Baja California become a consideration for a condor release? Our recovery plan for California condors requires us to re-establish the birds in as much as their former range as possible. Baja, being the southernmost recent range for the California condor, works well in that they were only recently lost from the area, mid-1930s, and considerable habitat still remains. It is very isolated with very few people in the area. The mountains are spectacular, ranging up to 10,000 feet, or 3,000 meters. Our selected release site is at nearly 8,000 feet, 2,400 meters. Mike, how many birds do you envision flying free in this area, Baja, in the future? We will be releasing four to eight birds on a yearly basis and will reconsider the situation when we have 20 birds in the area. What age do the birds have to be before moving them? That's a good question. Typically, we move them at eight months to 18 months old. Birds are ready to fledge, or leave, from the nest at six to seven months of age. In our current release group in Baja, we have birds as old as 30 months. It will be interesting to see how they behave. I expect that they will want to range more than younger birds and make it challenging for us to keep up. Is there a maximum number of birds a certain area can support? Yes, it's called the carrying capacity for any area, for any species. In our case, our strategy to find that number is to saturate the environment to a level where we determine that the birds are showing difficulty either in finding food, behaviourally, or in survivorship. That level is greatly determined by the availability of food in the area and nesting possibilities. Now look at questions 26 to 30. What do you hope to accomplish with this release in the long run? I expect that well within 10 years the condors will be flying north and joining birds already released in Southern California. Hopefully we will reach at least 150 birds in each of these populations within about 15 years. What would you say is the biggest contribution to the California condor program's success? That would have to be the fact that we were able to breed the birds in captivity from the 27 birds we started with in 1987 to the 205 birds we have today. This is thanks to cooperation between the San Diego Wild Animal Park, the Los Angeles Zoo, and the World Center for Birds of Prey in Bois, Idaho. Are there any problems keeping track of and protecting your released animals outside of the US? Nope. We are using radio transmitters and will be using the new satellite and GPS transmitters as well. Which system is better? Using satellites. The advantages over radio telemetry are numerous. It makes it possible to keep up with the bird's flight without being led miles in a matter of minutes. It took the young condor only a week to migrate across the state, and with just radio telemetry, poor weather can keep a plane grounded and not all roads are accessible to track them on ground. New technology will allow one to be able to track birds that are not accessible by plane. Also, it is a new way to gauge the effectiveness of reintroduction. How so? If a condor transmitter works properly, researchers will get a location every 10 days for about two years. Do you see an end in sight for the need to breed condors in captivity? Yes, that would be great but it will take a while for us to establish the two wild populations and make sure that they are sustainable. Part of our recovery is to maintain a captive flock of 150 birds in various zoos around the country as a safety net for the future. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about dorm rooms. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to your new home for the upcoming year. These dorm rooms are among the best in the nation and are the newest ones at this school. So I hope you will all learn to appreciate them and take good care of all the facilities here. I am Gina, and I will be residential advisor in this building for the year. Today I am going to tell you about some of the programs and facilities that are available to you. I will also be telling you the rules that everyone is expected to abide by. I will be asking you to give me your full attention for the next few minutes. I will first tell you about the facilities that are available to you. The dining facility is located on the first floor of the building. It is open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to midnight. All the food offered to students is freshly made every day, and my own opinion is that the food is actually quite good. Feel free to come and grab a banana for breakfast or sit down with a group of friends for dinner. Although your meals are served buffet style, please do not waste food. All students are expected to clean their own tables after meals. In the basement of this building, there is a gym and recreational hall. The gym has workout equipment such as treadmills and weight sets. In the recreational hall, there are ping pong tables and a pool table for student use. You must sign in when using this equipment, and you will be held responsible for any damages or losses. The gym and recreational hall are open daily from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. There is a kitchen located on the second floor of this building. Your dorm key will open this door. Inside there is a refrigerator, a microwave, an oven, and a stove. This room is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. If you decide to cook a meal, please be considerate to all the students and clean up after yourself. You can use some food in here, but please do not make a mess. Some students do end up having their food eaten from the fridge, so be careful. Don't leave anything that looks like it tastes really good. Do not leave pots and pans lying around in the kitchen. Please store these in your room. There are many programs being sponsored by our building this year. One of the most popular is our Saturday morning outings. In the past years, these trips have included going fishing, hiking, cycling, ice skating, and even going to the beach. There will be a listing of schedule events coming out soon. The university sponsors these trips, so transportation will be provided. However, there are usually some costs associated, though they are usually minimal. Our building also has a volleyball team, all students who live in this building are welcome to join. Last year we won first place in the dorm league. Please sign up at the front desk if you are interested as soon as possible, as there are only 20 spaces available, based on a first-come, first-serve rule. The last things I want to talk about are the rules of our building. I know rules can be boring, but they are necessary to ensure the welfare of everyone living here. First, noise levels must be kept to a minimum after 11 p.m. Many students have early classes, so for those of you that have the luxury of sleeping until 10, please don't stay up late making lots of noise. Secondly, all visitors must sign in at the front door. Even if you have friends that are regular visitors, they must still always sign in. This rule is to prevent theft and robbery from occurring. Thirdly, alcohol and drugs are not permitted in this dorm in any place or at any time. Lastly, just be safe and have a great time. University is the greatest time of your life, so make the most of it. Thank you all for your attention. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.